Hey Willard LPC, it's Christine. We're so excited to join you today for our Sunday service experience. We may gather differently, but we're still a family. So grab your coffee and get ready to join us online today as we delve into the Word of God. We love you and we're praying for you. Good morning, everyone. We're here in week three on our online church at Willowdale PC. Thank you for joining in on our website or YouTube or Facebook. And uh, we're together, but we're not really together. But thank you for setting this time aside uh, to hear from God's Word. The title of our talk today is The Epitome of Courage. There's a lot of desperation right now for a cure to COVID-19 a vaccine to be developed, or at least a drug to be relied upon to lessen symptoms or, and, uh, or, or find a cure, a lot of uh, pressure in the scientific community. And it's forced some, some of our political leaders in the political world, to uh, want to rush this process. Everybody's worried about the economy. And the world can kind of get ahead of what's necessary and the process that we all have to go through to stay safe. As our communities, friends, and neighbors become more anxious, it's important for us here at Willowdale PC to uh, have spiritually appropriate medicine for our souls, kind of a vaccine for the emotional trauma of what we're going through, and to get that spiritual medicine for our souls from Scripture. To tell you the truth, I'm tempted to talk about anything else but anything to do with uh, COVID-19. If only for the sake of distraction, it would be great just to start a series that has nothing to do with anything that we're going through. But if somebody is suffering from gangrene in their foot, for the sake of distraction, we can't do a tonsillectomy. You know what I'm saying? we got to deal with what we're going through. And so I am going to bring a message today that I believe that God's dropped in my heart on the description of courage and what that means for us, the epitome of courage. Every week, we live in Canada. We live where we're living in our houses. Brings more restrictions, more isolation, Sometimes more hopeless possibilities, more questions, less answers. We don't know when it's going to end. And I believe that God would have us ingest some spiritual antidotes from the Bible to help us stay strong, stay the course, and uh, wait until he delivers us. So that's why the title, The Epitome of Courage. By the way, I did mention last week that Pastor Peter was going to be preaching this week, but for logistical reasons and uh, things changed in the middle of the week. Our staff had to stay home. I couldn't ask them to come in. And uh, for some other reasons, we're just waiting. Uh, hopefully, we'll progress in our isolation to the point where they'll let us gather again in the office a little bit. And then Pastor Peter and Pastor Earl will also uh, engage in uh, preaching a video message for you, but uh, so we made, a, we made an audible, we called an audible in the middle of the week, and uh, so uh, you're stuck with me again today. I want to take us to Ezra chapter 2, and then Ezra chapter 3 for a couple of verses. In Ezra chapter 2, we're going to read verse 64, and then uh, N65, and then we're going to go to chapter 3 in Ezra and read chapter, uh, verse 7. Ezra 2, 64 says, The whole company numbered 42,360, besides their 7,337 male and female slaves. And they also had 200 male and female singers. Now let's move over to the next chapter, Ezra 3 and verse 7. Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre, so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa, as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. Let's just pray and ask the Lord to help us glean some spiritual antidotes from Scripture today. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the consistency of the Bible. You said heaven and earth would pass away, but my words will never pass away. And so, 
Lord, when we are in these tough times, when trouble has come, we look to what you have promised. We look to what you say, and we pray that it will get deep, deep down in our hearts, that we will take it in, we'll ingest it, it will do our souls good, it will be medicine to our, our spirits and our souls and our psyche. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to look at the context for a moment this morning of what is happening here with the children of Israel, specifically the children of Judah and Benjamin in the southern kingdom. If we are now experiencing the beginnings of the destruction of our economy, the national crisis of feeling our society's insecurity and feeling the, the security that we lived in the West in, that we're used to, fall apart, then our key verses today speak out of a context that Judah was going through in the aftermath of their demise as a country when they were taken over and many of their people were carried off into Babylon. We can see many similarities. Judah and Benjamin, the southern kingdom of Israel, had been in captivity once Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked. They'd been in captivity 65 to 68 years prior to when the events in the beginning of the book of Ezra begin. The temple of Solomon, the palace, the city of David, the walls at Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, all had been destroyed, all had been pillaged and burned. Babylonians had left only the poor and the peasant farmers and the best minds and the best leaders, the nobility, they had been carried off to Babylon. They'd been sequestered, They've been isolated, quarantined if you want, not for sickness reasons, but set apart in a distant land away from the place that they had known their whole lives. And nearly 70 years had passed when we read that first verse in Ezra chapter 2. Does it sound a little bit like what we might be experiencing? Now, hopefully this doesn't last 70 years. I hope it doesn't last 70 weeks. It would be good if it just lasted 70 days, but we don't know when the end is coming but what we're feeling and the loss of security that feels maybe similar to what the children of Judah and Benjamin were going through at this time. How were they to live? The captivity had begun 610 B.C. approximately, and the prophet Jeremiah gave Judah instructions from God about how to survive and how to thrive in their captivity. And we read that in Jeremiah chapter 29. I'm going to read verses 4 through 7, and then verse 11. So this was written just as the captivity was about to take place and start about 68 years before um, they went back to Judah to rebuild. So let's read Jeremiah chapter 29, very familiar portion of Scripture, verses 4 to 7, and then verse 11. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. I just want to stop and let that one sink in for a moment to us today. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Then down to verse 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. So let's go over Jeremiah's instructions that he left the children of Judah and Benjamin on how to go through an isolation in captivity in Babylon from the verses that we just read. Build houses and settle down. Rest in peace and with family. Plant gardens. Put seeds in the ground. Eat what's produced. Continue making plans for the future. He's basically saying, do what you have to to survive. Let life continue. Continue to marry, 
have family, have children, talk about your future, look forward to a future. Increase in number while you're in captivity and isolation. Do not decrease. Makes me think of COVID-19, and I've been concerned about the prospects of the family of God, our church, people who are on the fringes of being a part of Willard LPC, what will happen to them. I take encouragement from the fact that the children of Judah, God had a plan for them when they went into isolation and captivity for them to increase and not to decrease. I pray that that happens with our church and to the body of Christ worldwide, wherever this is taking place. Then he says, seek the peace and prosperity of your city. You know, we don't work against our authorities, but we cooperate with those who are in authority, knowing that God put those in authority, our politicians, our leaders, our prime ministers, premiers, and mayors, over us, and we cooperate with them. Then he says, pray to the Lord for your city. Pray for your community. As it prospers, that will enable you to prosper we prosper as we help those around us to succeed and prosper. What enabled them to live out this list, according to Jeremiah? What would enable them to take these instructions and encouragement and put them into practice? Well, it's the promise that's found in verse 10. He says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and I will fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. That's the context of what we're talking about this morning. Now I want to compare for our edification today the exile of the children of Judah to our own isolation. Several truths emerge from the pattern that God has given as a template in the children of Judah. We can maybe adopt some of these principles during the COVID-19 captivity in our homes. I don't know if that name's going to catch on, but I'm using it for today. We're in captivity in our homes. How many have felt captive in your home? How many right now watching TV church feel captive, right? First, God knew ahead of time what his people would go through, and he equipped them, and he shared with them some truths so that they could endure and succeed and thrive and prosper. Second, he gave them hopeful instructions that were very specific. To be courageous, to live hopefully, to plant and to sow, to reap and to eat, to marry and love and have babies. Let me just say this, that when you put a seed in the ground, there's a time that has to elapse. Four months, five months, three months. But there's some time that has to elapse before the seed in the ground grows into something that can bear fruit. Before there's a corn stalk, before there's ears, there's hope when you put the seed in the ground. And God is saying by the, the things he's instructing the children of Judah to do when they're in captivity in Babylon, when you do these things, you're planting seeds of hope. You're saying, there's a better day coming. You're saying to yourself, I'm going to put the seed in the ground and I'm expecting something good to come from what I'm doing today in three or four months. What we're doing today is seeding hope. And I think that's really important for us to get through this difficult time. Don't stop living, he says, during the inconvenient captivity, when things are uncomfortable, when things are all different, when the language changes and the culture changes because you're living in Babylon. You're not in the land of Israel and Judah anymore. When you are enmeshed in the trappings of isolation, look to increase in numbers, not decrease Look in a time of judgment and hardship and trouble for God to show up. Look for people to turn back to God in this tough time. Let your numbers increase. Now, of course, he was talking about having children and physical numbers. But when we look at this for food for our souls and we think of the kingdom of God, I'm praying every day, God, help us not to lose one. We can't even go out right now and look for the one lost sheep, can we? All we can do is send messages out. All we can do is phone call. All we can do is video sermons at church. We can't even go leave the 99 and look for the one very easily today. But I pray, like Jesus prayed, that he wouldn't lose one of the ones that God had given to him. And I pray that we won't not 
we will not lose one of the ones that God has given to us in this local church, in this family. But more than that, I think the instructions of Jeremiah from God to the people going into isolation was, it's possible not only for you not to lose what you have, it's possible for your numbers to increase. How wonderful it would be if the numbers of people impacted by the truths of God's word and the positive message of scripture through this time when we have to video message and put things on our website, how wonderful it will be in this time if people find Jesus, if they commit their lives back to Christ, if they say, I don't know what's happening in the world. I can't make sense out of it. I got to find God. I got to find a church that'll help me. People the ground might be tilled. It might be ready for the messages that you have to your friends and to your family as you witness, as you share hope, as you plant seeds that God could even increase the numbers in his kingdom in every local church all across Canada and America, all across the world in every country where this is going on. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And then he says, seek peace and prosperity. Seek peace and prosperity where you live. Seek peace for your city. Make your city your city. Own it. This is a city that they were all in that they'd never lived in before in the cities and the towns of Babylon. But make the city that God places you in your city. Make it your city to prosper it. Do what you can to help your community. Do what you can to help those in authority. Do what you can to help your neighborhood prosper. Be there. Be ready to help to the extent that you can. You and your family, when you create an atmosphere around you where you contribute to it and you help to prosper it, will also help you prosper. It'll help you succeed. All of this is possible if we live courageously in the midst of our isolation. God and his word is counterculture. It's counter to the culture of the world. Everything that the world experiences through their senses and through their uh, flesh, the Bible has an answer and an antidote that is spirit first, that informs our souls, that informs our bodies to act as our souls and our thinking and our spirits indicate. We go to God's word to get what we must now do in the midst of all of this that we don't understand. We knew when it began, but we don't know when it's going to end. We have to trust you. We have to live courageously, and we have to seek peace where God has planted us. Lastly, hang on the promise that we see in verse 10. God promised a time limit, an end to the isolation. He names it. He says 70 years so that the people that went into isolation could know when it would be over, that it would be over, and then summon up the courage to get to the time that the isolation and the captivity would be over. God wanted his people to know that it would end, when it would end, and who would end it, so that they would look for that time. And after it would come a time when he would call for the courageous that made it to that time when everything ended to take another step of courage and to return to the place that he had taken them from. That's what he said in verse 10. That's the promise he wanted his people to hang on. So God, in our situation, would say to us today, I believe, live looking for the current isolation to end and for a new era to begin when this is all over, an era to return to a place that we are familiar with, a place where we used to be, a place that we used to be comfortable with. You know, we all used to come to church every Sunday morning here, and we'd be here at 10 o'clock or a few minutes after. Hopefully the enthusiasm when we all return will be early, and people will be at, here at 9.30 and say, I can't wait to get together with all my family and my friends from Willowdale, P.C. I'm hopeful that people won't get out of the habit of gathering together and that they'll remember what Hebrews 10.25 says, that don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together, you know? When we get the opportunity to be together again, oh, I want to run to that. I want us to be courageous and last. Not getting into the habit 
just because we're isolated and we're in a house captivity of saying, well, you know, I'm not going to go back and gather with the church. I've proven I can survive without the rest of those people from Willowdale, PC. But instead, to have a yearning in our hearts and to have a, a desire to be back together again, that's what I'm hopeful of. Live looking for the current isolation to end. It will not last forever. Tell yourself that. God says, I will come to you. I will fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. Even though Judah and Benjamin were being punished because they had turned their back on God in this Bible story, there was an end to when God would not stand in front of their enemies and he let Babylon come in. There was an end to the captivity that they would have to endure. In times of trouble, God loves to put in front of us Hey, there's a day coming when it won't be like this. Can you hang on? Can you be courageous? And in that day when it ends, will you also be courageous to start rebuilding? Jeremiah 31, 23 repeats this promise later. And he says, when I bring you back from captivity. We need to rehearse in our hearts, in our minds, when this COVID-19 isolation ends. When our economy is back in place, when God shows up again out of his graciousness, when he rescues Canada and the United States and China and Spain and Italy and the rest of the world, when the people turn back to God, will I have courage to get to the when? Will I demonstrate courage to get to the end? And so that brings us to my final point, which is similar to the title today, the epitome of courage. What does that courage look like that God is calling you and I to? And that's verse 7 in Ezra 3. He says, I'll read it again for you. Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters, gave food and drink and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre, so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa, as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. The time, 70 years, was defined. They had to look for the promise of God for their deliverance around 70 years after it started. King Cyrus in Ezra 1, the king of Babylon, or the king of the Medes and Persia more accurately by then, issues a decree to all the Jews in chapter 1 to every Jew in Babylon, that they were free to return to Jerusalem and Judah. They were free to return to the place that they had been captured, taken away from, and isolated at distance. Now, you would have thought that a lot of Jewish people would be chomping at the bit, knowing that the 70 years were up, and they would be rushing to get back to the place that they had been before this terrible captivity began. But out of the hundreds of thousands of Jewish exiles, only 49,897 people responded, and about 7,000 of them were slaves and housemaids and house servants. And a very small number actually answered the call to go back and rebuild what had been lost. Only 49,897 gave up the comfort of Babylon to pursue a life of rebuilding a fallen kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem. Leaders like Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, and Ezra that we can read about in these books surrounding where we, our text was and our, our key verses were today, these people modeled the courage that the rebuilders would need. Nehemiah starts rebuilding the walls and the enemies around. Judah don't want it to happen. And the story is in Nehemiah of the sword and the trowel, working with one hand to lay the bricks while you have a sword in the other hand to fight the enemy. These people left the comforts of Babylon. Nehemiah was in the courts of the king and he left that so burdened to rebuild what was lost. I wonder this morning when all this is said and done, if the comforts that we have gleaned from being at home and being away from the family of God and being away from the mission of helping people become authentic followers of Jesus in this church. I wonder if what we get used to will take on its own norm and we will not have the, the courage when God says, rebuild, 
rebuild. I want you to go back. I want you to deploy. I want you to get involved. I want you to use your spiritual gifts. I want you to teach Sunday school. I want you to be involved with the youth program. I want you to help in Treehouse and Relentless. I want you to uh, be an usher and a greeter and help out in hospitality and outreach and and help our refugees and help our refugee family and get involved in missions. I wonder if all the things that we need to rebuild when we're back together again, some of us will be just too comfortable. I pray it's not the case. Let's learn from this story. Out of the hundreds of thousands of people that could have gone back from Babylon to Judah, only 49,000 went, led by some very courageous leaders. Oh God, help me to be a courageous leader for the rebuild. When the call goes out to be courageous, when God says this is the epitome of courage, not just to survive the ordeal, but to thrive and prosper and then leave the comforts of that prosperity and come back to work in the kingdom of God so that we can keep the gains and the increase that happened when we were in isolation. What did the courageous rebuilders do? They moved from comfort to mission. From complacent to commissional. From captivity and isolation to rebuilding a kingdom presence. The epitome of courage is that the called go. Not that they're just called, but that the called and the people promised to seize the promise, seize the day, and go back and rebuild when it's all over. Are you looking for that day? Are you sitting at home today just thinking, about the day we can all be back together again when ministry can continue and flourish, are you saying to yourself, man, I'm going to sign up, I'm going to enlist, I'm going to commission myself as never before. I'm going to be the, the epitome of courage. I'm going to be the person that answers the call, not that just hears the call. I'm going to take the challenge from God. I'm encouraging us today, get the mindset now. When isolation and captivity of COVID-19 ends, Get the mindset now. I'm going to be ready to move. I'm going to be ready to deploy. I'm going to be ready to rebuild. Look at their hearts in Ezra chapter 7, verse 7, uh, uh, Ezra 3, verse 7, sorry. Look at their hearts in Ezra 3, verse 7. They gave money, they gave masons, they gave carpenters, they gave food, they gave drink, they gave oil. If I could sum up all of that is they continued to be generous. They were generous with their money. They took their comforts and they slashed them and they gave money. And they gave their time and their skills as masons and carpenters. There were hospitality people giving food and drink and oil. God calls us to live differently. It's not a time for hoarding. It's a time to get the mindset of the rebuild and be ready to answer the call. Let's be generous. Let's continue to fund the kingdom of God. Let's not have a lag when we return. Let's have the storehouses of God full so that ministry can happen to people who have been dying to hear from us for so long. They were empowered lastly by the king, King Cyrus, to do all of this. And we are empowered by a greater king than Cyrus, people. We've been empowered by King Jesus. Amen? We've been empowered by the king of kings, the king of our hearts, the Lord of lords, the one in charge, the son of God, he's commissioned us, he's empowered us, he's given us the authority to build the mindset to come back when the time is over of suffering and to rebuild God's kingdom. I read in my devotions this morning, Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14. I don't know why God is giving me encouraging words in my private devotions to add to the sermon, but this will encourage you, I hope. Psalm 27, 13 and 14. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. This part's good for me. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. And then again, and wait for the Lord. We are in a holding pattern. We've got to wait for the Lord. But as we wait for him, let's build the mindset to come back and answer the call of God to be the epitome of courage in, through, and after to rebuild God's kingdom. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. Pastor Earl is going to close us with a benediction and prayer. May the Lord be with you and your family this week as you think about the things he's set in our hearts. Amen. Eternal God, 
and our Heavenly Father. We thank you for your instructions to us this morning. We're reminded as believers to seek the welfare and the prosperity of our city. As such, we pray for the health and prosperity of our city and our country. We pray, God, for the health of those who are sick. We pray for the welfare of our frontline workers in this battle against COVID-19. We pray that your grand supernatural strength, protection, and wisdom to all our healthcare professionals, our scientists, the Prime Minister, the Premier, and all other government officials who are leading the charge in this crisis. We pray for those workers who continue to serve in these difficult times. We pray for their families that they would not be sick because of the sacrifices that have been made by these workers. Lord, we thank you for giving us our daily bread. We cry out to you to provide for our friends, our neighbors, and all those hurting in our communities. We pray that you grant us the spirit of generosity, that we will readily share our resources with those who are in need. Help us to give and not to count the costs. Help us as believers to support the decisions that are enacted for our safety. Today, Lord, we unite in faith with millions of Christians around the world, and we ask that you remove this pandemic from our world and instead give us a spiritual awakening. Hear our cry and make haste to help us. We need your mercy. We need your grace today, Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace from this day and forevermore. Amen. As we've already worshipped through the word at Willard LPC, we also worship through our giving and we want to give you an opportunity to keep giving to the cause of God. Online giving is available. It's really easier than ever to do. Just go to our website willowdalepc.com and click on the giving tab on the right hand side and under push pay click give here and you can give any amount just follow the simple instructions to give it'll take you less than two minutes and it's a very secure way to give it's really a wonderful way that we can continue to worship God for those who don't have access to the internet please share with them that they can drop off their tithes and offerings at the church in the office slot by the front door God bless you and thank you for your faithful giving.